Yes, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to GAP uh, for accepting the paper. And thanks for this new uh, regime that I get 60 minutes because the topic is so important and complex. So thanks a lot. So we stop at about two. All right. So I talk about objectivity, value-free science, and inductive risk. And I try to move the slide. All right. So uh, within the last two decades, increased discussion has been carried out of the triple of objectivity, value freedom, and inductive risk. It's an interesting discussion, and there are some open questions which I will address in this talk. One is how many distinct concepts of objectivity there are. There are many different numbers here. Is value freedom desirable? That's also a controversial question. And finally, is value freedom identical with objectivity? That's a question that seldom posed, but I won't pose it. Okay, so here's the content, introduction, objectivity, the ideal of value-free science, then the problem of inductive risk, then inductive risk and the objectivity of science, and then in the end, the end. Okay, I start with objectivity. The uh, uh, common situation concerning objectivity is this. Many contemporary authors uh, claim that there are many different concepts of objectivity between three and 13 mutually irreducible senses or concepts or conceptions or understandings of objectivity, which is possibly surprising, possibly not. Now, my counter thesis is that's false. There is just one core meaning of objectivity, and then there are some derived meanings and some criteria for objectivity. Criterion is not the same as a definition. All right, so I'm going to explain that. I begin with the contrast or opposition between objective and subjective, which is, by the way, easier in German than it is in English. Because when you talk about the subject of a talk, you mean what in German is Objekt. So that, that's because in the 17th century, these um, terms changed places. This has to do with uh, the transition from Aristotelian to modern philosophy. Long story, I'm not touching it. Roughly, one may say that the objective excludes the subjective. Um, now, the next question is, I'm going to be more detailed about that. The next question is, what sort of things are potentially called objective? And there, the general story is, I think, that's very obvious. It's reports, statements, stories, observations, etc. And most generally, I think one can say representations. And that concerns the core meaning of objectivity. Right? So an objective representation, what's that? Well, that is without, whatever that means in detail, without additional subjective elements, or more precisely, without genetically subject-sided distorting contributions. Genetically, not in the biological sense, but in the sense of genesis. So the genetically stuff that comes from the epistemic subject here and distorts the contribution from the object. And the objective is an objective report or reputation tries to represent the object as the object is, and not that the subject, the epistemic subject, contributes something distorting. So one can uh, re uh, rephrase that in the following sense. Objective representations, they contain only uh, ascriptions derived from the object in question. That has, of course, been unpacked, but that's the abstract idea uh, of objectivity. Okay, that's the core meaning. Then there is an additional meaning component that comes only to the fore when we consider the relationship of objectivity to truth which is a question that's almost not posed in the literature. So if you go to the uh, SEP article, the question, what's the relationship between objectivity and truth? I was really wondering, then I thought, because I, I can read that somewhere, but it's almost nothing there, which is very strange, I find. For me, it was just the obvious question, so I had to think myself, which is rather... Uh, okay, there's almost uh, no discussion in the contemporary literature, and then uh, I, I tell you what I think it is. Objectivity has the meaning component of fairness and balance. And that is the rejection of an unbalanced, subjective selection of traits of the represented object. And that has consequences, which is very interesting. I think in an extreme case, a report may contain only true statements, but may still not be objective because uh, the choice of the reported traits is one-sided. So you have a demonstration of 100,000 people, and you have uh, 100 people who make chaos, and then you write many sentences just about these 100 people in, in, with the intention to describe the whole demonstration. That's, of course, not objective, but every sentence may be true. So that's the difference here between uh, objectivity and truth that, that I found very interesting. 
I would have loved to find it in the literature because then I could have a longer holiday. Anyway, so objectivity has also derived meanings. That was the core meaning. And there are two in two steps. I give you the derived meanings. The derived meaning that in addition to representations, also processes, individuals and institutions are sometimes called objective. And the reason is then very clear and the connection to the core concept if they produce objective representations then you call these things also objective. For instance, an objective procedure in order to determine something is a procedure that leads to objective results. So it's quite understandable what's happening there. Then there are watered down derived meanings. That's something else again. So um, you abstract from certain meaning elements and for instance, uh, some people, I, I don't like it because I don't really understand when someone says it's an objective process. But the idea is that it runs without human intervention, like when someone says evolution is an objective process. I wouldn't use that language because I think it's not very clear, but this is how it's used as well, and it's also sort of part of this objective concept. Uh, oh, an objective court decision, because that's very interesting, because a court decision doesn't represent anything. Right? There is no representation of something, of justice, no, not really. No, so it just means a balanced non-partisan. Uh, thing. So we have a, a widening of the objects uh, that can be um, uh, determined or, or uh, described as objective or non-objective. And then there is a very, very important difference between the meaning of a concept, some people prefer to say the definition, I prefer to speak here about the meaning, the meaning of a concept and criteria of application of the concept. If you're familiar with the theory of truth, then you may see the same there. So you may have a definition of truth in terms of correspondence, and you say the criteria we get in terms of coherence. Coherence is not a definition of truth in my field. Anyway, so there's a definition and criteria. Um, and you've got to take criteria in a very wide sense, including signs, symptoms, indicators, proxies, as such. They don't have to be necessary. They don't have to be sufficient. They can enormously differ in strength. And there are these indicators, symptoms of objectivity, and such criteria may also be used as means to improve objectivity. So you know something is correlated, a property is correlated with objectivity, then you can say, okay, if we improve upon this one, then we may improve um, objectivity. So for instance, intersubjectivity is something, I mean, the meaning of intersubjectivity is really not objectivity, it's just something else. I mean, even if a thousand people say that's the same, no, that's nonsense. Intersubjectivity means something else, but it may be an indicator for objectivity. Not a very reliable one, but I'm not talking about strength. Or value freedom is another one. I mean, when you know that your values distort the representation of something, of course, that's against objectivity. So value of freedom may be, again, a sign of objectivity, a symptom. It's not a definition of objectivity. It's, a different, it's got a different meaning. And uh, so the result is what other authors see as different senses of objectivity, up to 13. I see as different criteria for one and the same concept of objectivity with the core meaning and these derived meanings and watered down meanings. <clears throat> so much to... Oh, I forgot more. Okay, so... The importance of the difference between meaning of a concept and criteria for the concept is, in, in this particular case, very important, I think. It should not be overlooked. So the example is intersubjectivity. So if intersubjectivity is part of the meaning or the meaning of objectivity, then any violation of intersubjectivity is necessarily, conceptually, a violation of objectivity. So if you make this identification, you see a violation of intersubjectivity, then the alarm goes off. Oh, objectivity in danger, right? Automatically, if, if intersubjectivity is part of the meaning of objectivity. If you see that differently, namely as a criterion, if intersubjectivity is a criterion of whatever strength of objectivity, then a violation of intersubjectivity is not necessarily a violation of objectivity. It may be, but not necessarily, because there's not the, not the conceptual <coughs> connection. And the effect of the violation of objectivity must then be investigated. It may or may not threaten objectivity. And that's a whole different research agenda. And also for your emotional balance, it's better to have this one, because then you know the second one, because I've got to sit down and think. And you can immediately explode in the first case, right? And say, alarm, alarm, das Abendland ist in Gefahr. Okay. 
Um, so, what about the ideal of value-free science? And that is now very important because this discussion, I think, is heavily influenced by this relationship between objectivity and value-free science. It has been controversially discussed for more than 120 years, especially intensely in the last two decades, mainly due to the work of Herbert Douglas. And this critical discussion of the ideal of uh, um, value-free science has several strands, and I'm only picking out one uh, only, namely that the ideal cannot be held up because an influence of social values on science is un unavoidable. And uh, this uh, stems from Rudner and uh, other authors as well at the same time in the 50s. The scientist qua scientist makes value judgments. And that was then, oh God, the scientist makes value judgments. That must, that's horrible, uh, absolutely horrible. Now, one has to see first that the phrase value-free science is deeply misleading and is constantly misleading at least lay people, not philosophers, they know everything, but, but lay people are then sometimes misled because there are two, at least two heterogeneous sources for the, um, of accepted values that influence science, non-scientific values, in that case, the choice of the research topic. You're just interested in, you know, it's socially relevant, or you've got the money, or you want to impress your girlfriend, whatever, I mean, uh, what, what, what the motivation is uh, to choose a research topic. And then we have something completely heterogeneous, so-called scientific or epistemic values, like predictive and explanatory power, accuracy, scope, consistency. Some people add simplicity, I'm a bit reluctant here. Now, the point is we have value, they are necessary for the scientific process because you have to evaluate steps and results of the research process with respect to their scientific merits. And you have to, as a scientist, constantly you have to do that. Uh, also in philosophy, by the way. Anyway, so you have to have these scientific values, and, and they are, of course, not in, uh, in uh, contradiction to the ideal. It's just, um, uh, it, it's just as, a fact, as a matter of fact, the, the operative for realizing objectivity to have the scientific value. One can describe them as such. And the ideal of value-free science rejects the influence of non-scientific values in the context of justification. That's the idea. And Heather Douglas has a, oh, I, uh, she has a good formulation for that. She says, if you use values instead of data, then you're making a really mistake. Uh, okay. So, what are the arguments for value-free science? Why are, is value-free science a good thing? So, for many scientists, it's automatic. Uh, value-free, of course it is. Uh, but why, what are the arguments? And the core arguments for value-free science seems to be science's goal of objectivity. Many people don't express that, also philosophers. You only have to guess. Why do they think value-free science is a good thing? And the standard answer, although, as I said, it's really in many science and philosophy papers, it's implicit, but I think that's behind it, science's goal of objectivity. And um, why can, under, under these circumstances, or in that reading, why can you be content with the influence of values I noted earlier, namely in these two different sources, values in topic selection, well, they are neutral with respect to objectivity, so you can't do anything wrong by investigating something. Objectivity is certainly not uh, an issue then. And the scientific values, I already mentioned that, they are conducive to objectivity, or even, I would go so far, they operationalize objectivity. If you have only the abstract idea of objectivity, so I want to be objective now. Okay, so what's the next step? Right? And then I say, the values guide you there. If you take the scientific values, they tell you what you have to do in order to be on the road uh, to objectivity. So that's fine. And whereas non-scientific values in the context of justification are detrimental to objectivity, right? If, if you think, um, I like this and that, and, and then you say, okay, let's push the data a little, you know, because that this is the outcome we should have. That's not science, okay? So the point is now, as I mentioned already on an abstract level, if one equates objectivity with value freedom, then any value, any attack on value freedom is automatically an attack on objectivity. You don't have to think anymore. You see the violation of value freedom and the alarm goes off, right? And the urban blood is in danger again. Uh, but only if you equate objectivity with value freedom, which you shouldn't do because it means something else and you have to investigate the uh, relation. Um, this is at least my thesis here. So the problem of inductive risk is exactly in this uh, problem field 
uh, of objectivity and value um, is located there, and the discussion starts with Rudner's 1953 article, the scientist qua scientist makes value judgments, and he means social values, so ethical values, he calls them sometimes. Um, value judgments regarding, oh, I've seen that before. Okay, value judgments regarding ethical values, uh, and it happens in a core activity of science, namely uh, hypothesis, acceptance, and rejection based on the uh, available empirical evidence, and Rudner claims here, look, social values come into play here, and that's, of course, a catastrophe. He says so. The reason here is because why, why is it so that these social values invade science? The potential damage of mistakenly accepted hypothesis must be considered. The higher the potential damage, the higher the acceptance standard must be. So the, the question is, if you have, uh, have something, a result, and then you apply, and then people die, then, of course, yeah, the, the social values influence your scientific standards. And Rudner is indeed highly alarmed, a first-order crisis in science and methodology, and, um, well, it wasn't perceived as such. So if you write a doctoral dissertation and make two publications, be careful with these very strong alarmistic um, ideas. People, you may be wrong, you know, for whatever reason. Okay, and the situation is later called the problem of inductive risk. So it's the invasion of social values into the process of science, and then people having in mind that's a bad thing when if the value-free ideal is violated and therefore alarm. Right? And I say, wait a minute, let's analyze what's happening there. Okay? So um, it's interesting to see to avert this danger of the invasion of social values into science, and that's very obvious that people were immediately alarmed, and two main strategies were proposed. And the first one is scientists do not accept or reject hypothesis. This is where Rodner said, here the values come in. And uh, Jeffrey said, wait a minute, scientists don't do that. They do not decide. They only assign probabilities. And the reduct inductive risk problem arises only for sciences and policy advisors in applied science. So Jeffrey says, that's not a problem because they don't do that. That is dangerous. Fine with us. So we are value-free. Wonderful. The other strategy is that scientists are committed to using only scientific values for hypothesis evaluation, so Lee values this. And, and he says, well, that doesn't happen because scientists are not influenced by the social values. He just denies that the phenomenon exists. So one denies the, the presupposition of the phenomenon, and the other one denies the phenomenon itself. Well, both strategies don't work. Very obviously, they don't work. Because all experimental scientists must assess the danger of experiments they want to perform, and this necessarily involves social values. So every social scientist, it's not only in the, when you apply hypothesis, it's in the heart of experimental science. You see that here it makes a difference whether the maximal danger of an experiment is a broken Erlenmeyer flask, the blow-up of the lab, or the destruction of the Earth. Right? And you've got to take care of that difference. And I'm not exaggerating, alarmingly. The example for the latter is the Trinity test of the atomic bomb, July 16, 1945. The danger of the experiment was triggering a nitrogen fusion reaction in the atmosphere, really destroying the whole Earth. Not metaphorically, you know. Really destroying the whole Earth in a fusion reaction and boom. We wouldn't be here. Couldn't go to God. No, it's really bad. So... Um, the usually accepted inductive risk in physics for a falsehood, as you see in the um, particle experiments, is one in three million, and the physicists there, and we have explicit testimony there. That wasn't considered good enough in the Trinity case by the physicists involved. Clearly so. You've got to categorically exclude that the world blows up, blood blows up completely. So it's a clear invasion of social values into basic physics. So the problem is there, and all these... The strategies, the main strategies, they're just, I mean, in a sense, ridiculous if you think once about it. So if they are there, you can't avoid it. So the problem of inductive risk has later been generalized and deepened for very good reasons. Namely, social values may include signs not only in the hypothesis acceptance situation, as Rudner had it, but it's absolutely right. There are other stages in the research process. And uh, if you then are alarmed, then I, would, I shall propose a different strategy to deal with inductive, uh, inductive risk. 
and by asking the question, what is the relationship between inductive risk and objectivity? Now, the presupposed claim is the problem of inductive risk is unavoidable in science, including basic science. So the two strategies from the beginning, they certainly don't work because it's absolutely obvious that these social values uh, invade science and the question is, what's the damage? Right? We've got to see that. It, it, it does not only confirm hypothesis testing, but every decision to perform an experiment, or maybe exploratory or whatever it is, you've got to find out how dangerous that damn experiment is. Whether you blow up, you laugh, or you kill people or whatever, you have to do that in science. And that's a social value. I mean, from a scientific point of view, it doesn't make a difference to blow up a professor. So what? I mean, scientifically, that's unimportant. Well, socially, it's not. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the higher the potential damage, the higher the probability must be that the damage does not occur. That's just common sense, right? It's absolutely trivial, it's common sense. And thus the ideal of a science free of social and moral values cannot be upheld. It just doesn't work. It's just plain wrong. And there is no escape from that. Now the question is, what's the damage? What's the implications for the objectivity of science? And because most people just, or at least the majority, think, you know, objectivity is just value freedom, and then this result is, oh, value freedom is over, so back to the Middle Ages or something, or Stone Age or whatever. Now, if you look a little closer, it depends, you know, if you, well, I said that already, if you equate value freedom with objectivity, then indeed the objectivity postulate for science cannot be fulfilled, game over. But... If value freedom is a criterion of yet undetermined strength for objectivity, then the effects of a violation of value freedom upon objectivity must be investigated in each case. You've got to look at it. Is it really dangerous or is it just, you know, blind alarm? So let's look at these cases. <clears throat> Assume that you have a certain accepted standard for claiming that routine experiments will create no damage, which you have in every lab. You know exactly what you're doing, you know, and then you know it doesn't go wrong. Everything is fine. Now, in case of possibly larger damage, this standard will have to increase, obviously. I mean, the, more, the higher the danger is, you've got to say, oops, we've got to be a little more careful. I mean, it's not just an Erlenmeyer or just the death of a professor, but, but you know, it, it's the whole earth. And that's even worse, right, than killing one professor. It's an accident for science. I mean, okay. So, the hypothesis that no damage will occur will have to be confirmed to a higher degree. That's obvious in the, in the Trinity case, you see that immediately. So, in other words, the objectivity requirements on the hypothesis will increase due to the possible damage. So, you have to be better scientifically so that objectivity requirements will, will increase. And therefore, in such cases, the influence of social values does not work against objectivity, but quite on the contrary, it increases the objectivity standards. So, we can only hope that possibly many damages are there, because that means the science has to get better, more objective, and, and having then a uh, good judgment to say that won't happen. So it's just the other way around than the common opinion. And now the other way, I mean, this is the false uh, negative and about uh, no, the false positive, and how about the false negatives? There, the situation is importantly asymmetrical. In cases in which one wants to lower the standards for objectivity of a hypothesis uh, in order not to miss potentially useful applications, it does not concern science itself. You see that immediately in these experimental treatments in medicine. So you have some sort of drug, and uh, from a scientific point of view, you're not yet allowed to apply. And then the doctor may say, look, we can use that drug experimentally. We have no scientific basis for the application, but there is some hope that it will help you. Yeah? And there is some hope that the, the uh, damage is smaller than the potential benefit. And then people will say, I don't have a scientific um, uh, justification for that, but we may try out. And that's explicit, it's outside of science. So you may lower in order not to miss potentially useful applications, you may lower the standard of objectivity, but that is not a danger for science because it's explicit and everyone knows it because you have no scientific reason to lower it, but you say, well, there is a potential benefit and I want to have it. <clears throat> okay, so the summary is this. How am I doing on time? Still 30 minutes? Okay, good. So, objectivity has one core meaning. That's important. And you can find that, by the way, in the authors when you look very carefully 
Then one says, for instance, in the SAP, SAP article, uh, there is one particular natural meaning. Okay, and then you say, oh, the others are unnatural, that's fine, but no consequence. So I think it really has one core meaning. The apparent variety of concepts of objectivity is a variety of criteria for one and the same objectivity, possibly in watered down uh, meanings, but that's not so important for the science case. The ideal of value, free, value freedom is not identical with objectivity. It's a criterion of unknown strength or undetermined strength. The violation of value freedom is therefore not ipso facto a violation of objectivity. One must get out of that, that um, you know, coercion to think violation of value freedom is ipso facto violation of objectivity. Two different concepts, therefore it must be investigated. The intrusion of social and moral values, as discussed in the problem of inductive risk, is not a threat to the objectivity of science. Just the opposite, funnily enough. Avoiding false positives increases the objectivity standards. Avoiding false negatives through the application falls outside of science. So no real reason for alarm. Thank you very much. <clears throat>